Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of uh, Expert Insights. Uh, we've got Gabriel Preda with us today, uh, our author of our latest book, Developing Kaggle Notebooks. Uh, before I ask Gabriel to introduce our, uh, himself to all of us, it would be great if everyone can just confirm they can hear us. So we know that it's not just the two of us talking to each other, but there are more people who can hear us and view us. So if, if you are online and if you can see us, please just drop a co comment saying that, yes, you can. So we know that there are no technical glitches. We're not talking to each other. <laughs> really hope that people can hear us. Can you hear me, Gabriel? Uh, yes. Uh, I can so hear you. The two of us will be fine. OK. Uh, <laughs> let's hope that there are people. There should be some comments coming in. There, there is someone yeah. saying hello, guys. Ah, thank you okay. so much, Ernest from YouTube. Thank you for confirming that you can hear and see us. Perfect. Let's get started. Uh, so, Gabriel, can you please start with introdu introducing yourself, who you are? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Gabriel Prena. Um, I have a background in research and development. Uh, in the latest years, I started to work mostly in data science and machine learning. Currently, I'm a principal data scientist at Endava, which is a software service company. And as well, uh, I'm a triple Kaggle Grandmaster. So I've done in the past five to six years, a lot of work in the world of uh, competitive predictive modeling, uh, and I'm quite active on Kaggle. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Uh, I can see a lot of comments coming in. Uh, there's another Gabriel, Tanislav. <laughs> he's confirming that he can hear us. There's Marias. Yes, I can. Thank you so much, Marias. Vinay on YouTube. And then Gabriel says again, we can see and hear you. Thank you so much for confirming, everyone. Uh, if you have any queries that you would like Gabriel to answer, please add them in uh, to the chat, and we will pick them up, and Gabriel will answer them. Uh, while you're waiting for others to ask your queries, I have a few of them that I listed on LinkedIn and YouTube both. Uh, so I'll start with the first one. Uh, Gabriel, why, why do you think Kaggle notebooks are important, uh, especially for people who are not on Kaggle? How does it play an important role? Um, thank you. I think it's a very good question, especially as an introduction for uh, the subject of my book. Uh, first of all, Kaggle notebooks for everybody, not only for people on Kaggle, are uh, very good quality code with open access. So people, even if they are not active on Kaggle, once they register there, they can download uh, all kinds of analysis, uh, as I said, with the high quality code uh, written by a uh, large community right now we're like more than 16 million people active on Kaggle. Uh, data scientists, machine learning practitioners, data analysts, uh, with all kind, with, uh, all kind of uh, specialization and uh, level of experience. Uh, they're important uh, as models, um, as educational resources, uh, as a model of uh, community collaboration, I think Kaggle is very important because, uh, you know, it's, we will not have only authors uh, like writing de definitive uh, 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 sources of knowledge. You'll have a whole community collaborating in improving through comments, through forking one other content and refining in a separate notebook uh, through um, validating uh, the work done in the Kaggle notebook uh, by preparing a model and submitting into a competition. So everything from uh, having open access to quality code, uh, having access to uh, educational resources, uh, performing commu this community collaboration, uh, as well being able to compare different solution and uh, you know basically benchmarking some of the uh, problems uh, through Kaggle notebooks. 
uh, and source of inspiration for people outside uh, Kegel. Kegel Notebooks offers you all these um, facilities. Once you are on Kegel, then you'll be able to uh, get much more value from the notebooks because, as I said, you can only by forking one existing notebook, you can start that experiment by yourself. And you don't need to install anything because when forking, uh, environment is created for you and you are, you know, ready to go. So it's very easy, especially for people at the start, right? So which doesn't have a lot of experience. Right. Thank you so much, Gabriel. I can see that a lot of people have started adding their comments, hashtag back. Uh, there's a ticker going on at the bottom uh, over here. So people who've just joined us, there's a ticker going on at the bottom. There will be two giveaways for Gabriel's latest book. We'll give away two eBooks during the session live. So if you want to be a part of it, and if you would like to win an eBook, please comment hashtag pack. There are all the instructions and guidance over here at the bottom. Uh, we have someone who's a person with a very good sense of humor. Unfortunately, it's not showing his name over here. <laughs> It's Ovidyu Kalin Rotaru. So Ovidyu says that I have a PhD, but not so much hair. Please don't kick me out. I'm trying to gather some <laughs> nice data sets for you. Well, uh, uh, I also have you, a PhD Ovidyu. and not too much hair. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start <laughs> for a yeah, conversation. At least, <laughs> yeah, at least both of you have PhD. I'm just losing my hair. I don't even have a PhD. Yeah. So uh, we're still waiting for more questions to come in. So anyone, if you all do have queries, please add them in. Uh, I will ask my next question again, Gabrielle. I have another one. I just had it in my notes over here. Oh, just a sec. I just lost it. Just kept all my notes ready to ask you questions. So, uh, Gabrielle, how do uh, how does one effectively handle missing values, outliers, and understand the distribution of data sets provided in the competition? Um... Yeah, so this is also something that I'm treating in the book uh, in several of the chapters. Uh, you know, the first step, uh, whether you want to do a, a detailed data analysis or your aim is to build a model, you'll start with understanding the data. So um, data quality is extremely important. Uh, you mm. need to know as much as possible about it and uh, to to get to your questions uh, missing values well uh, i will also mention that about the missing values it's very important to understand uh, if you have missing values or it's something different there in the book that is an example where we think we have missing values but actually there is an error where when parsing the the file so the first step is really understanding uh if you have missing value or it's a problem with the like data ingestion uh, uh could be an error from that and uh, this is uh, one of the examples in the book now if you have missing values first you need to understand uh, how these are represented could be uh, not a number nor uh, or an, any other pl placeholder Especially if your data comes from production, you might see there missing values represented in various ways. So you need to understand actually uh, how uh, the data is represented when it's a missing. And then you have to uh, determine the reason for missing values. Could be, as I said, data collection error, could be ingestion error, could be incomplete data, could be something that it's telling you something about the data. Like, just give you an example. Um, you run a questionnaire and you have men and women and you ask the age some of the user maybe women will refrain to give you the age because uh, they want to be discreet about this the same about income right so you need to understand if it's something which is really missing like uh, totally random missing data or it's something that it's telling you something about uh, that specific entry and then you need to decide uh, and we are still talking about missing data, we can talk all day, uh, you need to decide the appropriate strategy. Like, uh, once you decide what is the source of the missing data, you need to understand, okay, how will you place? Sometimes you just drop rows or columns with missing data, depending also uh, on uh, uh, how many of them are. 
uh, and how important might be that feature or that data entries, uh, or you can try to do data imputation for very simple, like you just fill the missing values with the average value for that feature, or you can like you decide depending on what data is there to use mean, mod, and you can even build uh, a model to generate prediction for the missing data. Now, when you have outliers, it's the same. I mean, uh, first you, it's a first step will be to really understand uh, the quality of that uh, outliers. So uh, the context, right? So could be giving really, you know, uh, extreme values, like for example, let's say that there are the prices for um, uh, some uh, uh, real estate uh, assets, right? Could be in a very high range. And, some of them could be genuine, right? If it's a very expensive mansion, that it's uh, valid, but could be an outlier because the data was inputted incorrectly. You miss like a comma or something. Uh, and then once you understand, you know, the nature of there, you need to decide, okay, how you'll treat. So for example, if you want to build a model, you probably want to uh, do a data transformation so that uh, like, you know, logarithmic or uh, box code transformation so that you'll get a normal distribution of the data to input. Or you can use just uh, intervals of values that all players will stay in one interval of value. Uh, again, uh, depending on the objective and the nature, the origin of those, you you have different strategies. And I think it was a question about uh, uh, how and data uh, distribution how, right yes how how to effectively yeah. handle missing values outliers and uh, yeah and the uh, distribution distribution of data set right uh, so uh, again uh, to to close the question about uh, outliers then once you identify and so you can use transformation but you can also remove some of them right uh, or uh, you can use like a threshold for minimum and maximum values and just remove everything which is uh, outside that interval. Uh, what is really important is one when you do this to really understand the characteristics of your data and, for example, not remove outliers, mm -hmm. uh, which will be important uh, for the model. Uh, now, uh, about the distribution of the data here, probably we can write a few books only on <laughs> this subject. So visualization, like uh, histograms, density plots, um, uh, scattered plots, uh, then you can look to um, mean and variance values, like uh, you can look to the median uh, mean values, uh, variance, uh, standard deviation to understand, uh, you know, the, the, how the, your data is spread. Uh, also, you can look to the data skewness and uh, perform also statistical te uh, tests. Then you can, once you you, you understood the, like uh, uh, distribution of the data for each feature, uh, mm -hmm. so then you can look to you know bivariate and multivariate analysis, and as well um, looking to the correlation of the features. Uh, yeah, so it's a very large subject. We can uh, maybe you can take some, you know, specific questions later about yeah. this. I can see a lot of comments have started coming in. So I'm really glad to see that people have started, uh, like, you know, just adding their comments to the raffle. Uh, there are people coming from a lot of different parts. We've got Eugenia. Hi, Eugenia. Greetings oh. from Uruguay. Uh, thanks for sharing. Then we've got uh, over you again. Over you mentions that uh, he forgot to add quotes. He wished he had <laughs> the PhD. He only has the book. He wants to be the guy who offers clean data. Well, let's hope uh, over you with this session, you learn something about clean data. My first question uh, to Gabriel was about that, how to handle messy data uh, in the data sets provided in the competition. If any of you have any queries, please do add it in. Uh, I'll continue with my queries until then. Uh, Gabriel, uh, just one query that I didn't add uh, in the description, but just something on the top of my head. Uh, in today's time, generative AI is moving really fast. And so how important is Kaggle 
and what role does your book play uh, and help? How does it help people learn about generative AI? Uh, well, um, Kaggle uh, it's offering in the last uh, year started to offer one very important feature, which is uh, Kaggle models. And mm -hmm. through Kaggle models, uh, one can now uh, have access to a large set of models uh, carefully curated. Uh, so you know that uh, uh, you have also other platforms like Hugging Face where everybody can store whatever model he wants. Um, on Kaggle, uh, they started with uh, very carefully selected models that uh, then uh, now it's open and uh, you can contribute to your own models as well, uh, like in Hugging Face. Uh, those models can be, uh, you know, uh, all kind, not only large language models or um, diffusion models or whatever, are a large variety of models. And those include as well, I said, large language models. So through uh, Kaggle, uh, models, you can have ac access and also using uh, the Kaggle notebooks, uh, both CPU and uh, GPU power, uh, you can create your own uh, experiment uh, sandbox and start, for example, querying large language models. Uh, and of course, you get all the facilities you have when you develop on Kaggle, it's an environment that uh, is created on the fly. Uh, most, for most of the cases, it's zero cost, um, unless you want to use Kaggle and uh, you know use the models outside the environment, uh, uh, which will be again like uh, behind the world page. Um, then, of course, with Kaggle notebooks, you can extend uh, the experiment and start, for example, to build, you can combine the large language models hosted on Kaggle uh, with LangChain uh, and create uh, small applications. And of course, <laughs> you can extend this application and create more complex application. And so you can learn how to design and um, develop uh, generative AI uh, type of applications uh, with this platform that it's offering you, um, you know, free uh, of cost, uh, the computational resources, the, uh, like large language model resources, uh, and of course, a lot of libraries. Some of them need to be installed. Uh, and then, of course, after you um, and learn uh, using uh, everything that Kaggle uh, offers to you, then you can you know, uh, start developing uh, uh, those applications for uh, you know, your own projects, deploy them in other clouds. Of course, one of the options would be to deploy on uh, GCP, and uh, uh, that means uh, Google Cloud, who is uh, hosting as well Kaggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will be the obvious simple uh, uh, option. Uh, by the way, Kaggle, it's also offering uh, an extension so that uh, once you start developing a notebook on Kaggle, then almost seamless, you can switch and get access to more resources, switch from uh, Kaggle notebook to Vertex AI notebook. Vertex AI being the uh, dedicated uh, machine learning uh, environment on Google Cloud. Perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, so sorry. I encourage you to, by the way, in my book, there is a chapter uh, that uh, it's uh, going through several uh, examples of application developed uh, using large language models and uh, uh, blank chain. Uh, and it's, you know, taking you from just prompting one large language models, uh, building um, a small application that will uh, generate uh, code as well as uh, um, uh, several steps uh, chain and uh, also it's even a retrieval augmented generation system 
which you can experiment with. And once you get to the point, then you can you know migrate your code and deploy it, uh, build it, and deploy it for already any platform you want. Yeah. So would, would that be that it's a good start. Yeah. Would would that be chapter number ten? Unleash the power of generative AI with Kaggle. Yes. 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 Uh, if you are interested to learn about generative uh, AI and you don't know where to start, this can be a good start <laughs> for you. Okay. Uh, we have a first query over here. Adarsh on LinkedIn inquires, how can I develop clean code, manage, uh, manage learning and practicing machine learning simultaneously? Uh, OK. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, the question is um, to start experimenting with machine learning and uh, developing clean code. Okay, so let's say that developing clean code it's something will never end, right? Because um, clean code is a concept that uh, it's mostly about uh, continuous improvement and it's more like, you know, uh, individual intellectual experience. So once you start on this path, you'll never stop because uh, if in the sense, so you want to have like to write good quality code and continuously improving it. And at the same time, uh, getting your hands dirty and uh, starting the experiment in machine learning. These two are not actually uh, contradictory. I know that, uh, you know, uh, traditionally, uh, you'll start experimenting with machine learning, writing, uh, you know, uh, dirty code in Jupyter Notebook, creating all kinds of experiments. In the book, I gave several examples, and uh, actually it's almost in all chapters. Once I do an ex experiment, like I validate some code uh, for the objective that I have, like uh, doing data analysis, uh, creating a model. I also extract uh, code uh, that can be, you know, reused in other notebooks, and I create small um, uh, on Kaggle are called utility scripts, small uh, Python modules that can be reused. And once I do this, I write this code. Like, you know, to be uh, not production ready, let's say, but to be uh, very simple to uh, reuse, extend, it's documented, and it really has the structure of, uh, um, what to say, a uh, Python uh, module. And I'm reusing through the book such um, modules uh, in various notebooks. So I, even if you are, learning to use uh, you know uh, machine learning and you want to rush to experiment and uh, uh, you know to do prepare your uh, models um, uh, and uh, uh, validate your uh, uh, results quick you can still from the start uh, you know write the code so that can be easily usable so i'll give you an example when you are doing for example Let's say that you are doing feature engineering and you are you know applying feature engineering on the training data and then you want to do this on the validation and test data. You can already write some uh, functions, right? Uh, that will be just part of your pipeline and will be applied to uh, those various uh, set of data. But once you do this, then you can extract them in a separate modules and you can abstractize something that it's really valuable, not only for this um, specific problem. And, you know, gradually you can start creating your own libraries. And tr trust me, you know, the, those uh, competition grandmaster that uh, uh, are so efficient and uh, are able to win several competitions in a row are actually doing this. They are writing very structured code and uh, they are creating uh, pipelines for training validating and uh, testing you know uh, data um, that are very close to like you know standards that you'll see when you're developing code for production uh, it's something that is not obvious because uh, uh, you know the code uh, uh, 
examples you'll find in Kaggle. Not all are so well structured, but uh, if you are like uh, following the uh, most famous uh, competition from master, you'll see that uh, you know they tend to have a, a quite structured code. Thanks a lot, Gabriel. I'll take one more question and then we will do our first raffle. So I'll, I'll, there's just one over here from Rishav on uh, LinkedIn. How can we mitigate substantial security threats within a model? Um, you need to be more specific. Uh, oh, okay. Rishav, can you be a little more specific with your, do you mean with the question or with the approach? Uh, uh, no, the the question. I mean, uh, what security threat? So, all right, Risha, can you please clarify in the comments what do you mean exactly? Uh, before we move ahead with the queries, I'll let's do our first raffle now. A lot of people have entered in the raffle, and I can see that. So let's do that first. Okay. So here's the screen, and here is the draw. Let's see who's our first winner. Quite a lot of people. Entered it. Oh, Adarsh Vishwanath. Uh, he was the person who just asked the last query. Uh, congratulations, yeah. Adarsh. You're the first giveaway winner. <laughs> so if you can just connect with me on LinkedIn and share your email address, I will get the book shared with you. Uh, congratulations for the first winner. There is another raffle. So don't be disheartened if you're not the winner of this first one. Uh, continue commenting hashtag pack as it says at the bottom. And yeah, we will announce another winner towards the end. I see we uh, have one. Okay, so Gabriel, uh, Rishav has come back and he said substantial security threats like prompt injection. Uh, okay, so uh, I think your question is, I guess related with uh, how can we mitigate substantial security mm, threats within a model? Well, and we inquired what threats. So, and it's the, so this is recent. Okay, like prompt injection. Okay, so I guess your question is uh, related uh, because you mentioned prompt injection. You probably um, refer here to. Uh, Generative models and the prompt it's about uh, generative models, so I'm not sure. Uh, okay, uh, Rishav, if you can just elaborate yeah, what uh, exactly. Yeah, I'm not, not clear. Uh, I mean, this question is about uh, uh, security of uh, systems that uh, are exposing, like, you no know, uh, machine learning models for performing inference and uh, how we protect these systems, or it's about uh, how we prevent that somebody is using such a model for harmful, because I, I, I'm i sorry, sorry, I don't understand the question. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Risha, if you can uh, just read You'll hear very very many really? times uh, from my side, uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't know. You know, no, it's something know. that uh, uh, data scientists say a lot. Um, That's fine. Rishav, if you can just type your entire query again and clarify things, that would be good. We yeah. can move on to the next query, Gabriel. Uh, Punso on YouTube inquires, one of the major challenge I encounter in machine learning is timeliness. Does the book explain timeliness, timelines, sorry, it's not timeliness, timelines extensively mm. with regard to data preparation and analysis? Uh, and uh, Okay, so this question it's about uh, how long it's taking to yeah. perform data preparation and analysis yes comparison i mean uh, in comparison with uh, how long will it take to you to prepare a model like huh? mm -hmm. well so uh, you know uh, there is this uh, saying that uh, Kaggle data scientists will spend zero time in uh, data preparation and analysis and 99% uh, of time uh, uh, doing like experimental models while in reality is the other way around so in this book there is a lot of time spent with uh, data preparation and analysis and in some cases i gave a lot of 
you know, um, I'm really dedicating a lot of time um, on the analysis part. Uh, in reality, you know, it really depends on the um, problem you are uh, working on. Um, sometimes this effort is actually uh, distributed, uh, especially it's a multi-feature uh, team. Just a second, Gabriel. I mean, uh, Funso has clarified that their query is uh -huh. about overlapping time for the training and test data set to prevent data leakage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in this book is not uh, analyze this specific issue. So uh, your concern is about, uh, uh, for example, the case when we have uh, time variable data and uh, we don't want, for example, to sample randomly uh, the uh, training when you do train validation uh, split, we don't want to sample uh, randomly this data because uh, obviously in such a case, uh, uh, we'll introduce data leakage, uh, having, you know, uh, part of the validation data, uh, um, like uh, validation data uh, in, the inter in the same interval with uh, uh, train data. Uh, there is not such a case. We do have a case uh, where we have temporal data uh, in one of the chapters. It's about the uh, uh, um, signal analysis. But in that case, we are actually doing data aggregation and we are sampling uh, the, uh, we do aggregate time aggregation for each uh, uh, a subsample of the trade data, and then inside of that uh, interval, uh, uh, the features that we are generating are uh, non temporal. And then uh, when we split between train and validation, we'll have uh, actually non time uh, variable uh, features. Uh, but such uh, an example is not in the book. On the other hand, when we do when we do have uh, 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 such a case, of course, uh, we'll make sure uh, that uh, we'll use for training, uh, let's say, the older data, uh, most recent data for validation, and then maybe a time interval for testing should be uh, uh, later in time, both compared with uh, train and validation. This is like common rule. And of course, if you are using uh, um, uh, cross validation, you'll need to design also in that case uh, a data split strategy where the validation data will be uh, at a later time uh, sampled uh, compared with the correspondent uh, uh, train data for the same uh, um, data split. So um, if you are interested, we, you can find uh, maybe in the reference, you know, including the data, some hints about uh, how to do this, but there is not a chapter also uh, on this uh, specific in, in the book. Dere Gupta on LinkedIn inquires, at what point should one use PySpark for data pipelining and transformations versus using mm -hmm. Pandas and Kaggle notebooks? Uh, Okay, so uh, it's a very good question. Uh, you need to use for data uh, processing, actually for all the uh, steps, but let's say, okay, data ingestion, uh, um, data processing, uh, you need to use that solution that it's fitting uh, with your problem. So you have a very, a small amount of data, um, pandas will be enough. Even with Kaggle, you might have a very large volume of data. And in that case, you might want to start using uh, maybe uh, Polaris, right? And uh, uh, then there are other strategies that you can adopt. Uh, let's say that, uh, you know, that in Kaggle, you'll have a limited amount of uh, um, uh, 
memory for CPU is like uh, 30 gigabytes and uh, for GPU it's even smaller. I think it's 16 gigabytes. Uh, so the first option, uh, also with pandas, you can drop some of the columns and rows. Uh, with pandas and dash, I think you can um, uh, use, uh, you know, segments of data, uh, batches of data. Uh, then you can switch to Polas. Polas is much efficient compared with pandas in terms of uh, working with memory. Uh, of course, then you can switch the uh, the format uh, from uh, like uh, um, just in, ingest your data in batches and uh, transform it feeder or parquet format and then uh, use more more efficient uh, format. Uh, to further process the data, so you can do this separately in a notebook, and then you work with uh, a more um, um, com, um, efficient uh, format. Then, still in Kaggle, you can use, for example, Polars, which is much more efficient in terms of memory and also speed than Pandas for larger data sets. Then uh, you still have, like, for example, if the uh, not the volume of data, but uh, the time to process the data is the problem. Also on Kaggle, you can still use uh, instead of pandas or polars or like more efficient formats uh, to process with these uh, uh, libraries. You can switch to, uh, you know, you have on GPU, you have these rapids library which has uh, uh, you know using uh, it's on top of uh, pi arrow uh, it's i think uh, kuda kudf uh, it's i don't have uh, the exact uh, statistics but um, maybe in some cases more than 100 times faster than uh, will be pandas right mm -hmm. so you have depending on what are your needs uh, you also on kaggle you have all those options like, uh, you know, using less data, uh, processing data in batches, transforming the format, switching from pandas to polars uh, or QDF. Uh, then you, of course, if you, your data is really huge, of course, you can switch uh, remaining with uh, um, Google Cloud. You can still use, as you suggested, PySpark. Uh, and you have other options as well, right? So there were like, you know, competition from Kaggle, like, where, uh, where you are using data uh, stored in the BigQuery and so on. Yeah, I agree, you know, uh, in, for many cases, in many cases, uh, when you are going from competitive uh, modeling to like real life project with a huge amount of data, PySpark, is not the only option, but uh, it's one of the best options, right? And again, really depends on what you need. You need fast processing, uh, small memory, uh, large volume, large profile. So many uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, the most important is to fit in what you need and uh, in the budget. Right, so we have a very long question from Rishab. Yeah, Rishab had tried yeah, da, 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 da. to explain it. Unfortunately, yeah. I cannot see yeah. the entire comment. I, I can read, I can read. Uh, sure. Okay, let me post it here. Wow. Okay. In the context of generative model, where I have seen previous security threats, which can make LLM susceptible to generate bias outputs, like if you use rack framework and upload a document with an evil sentence embedded in the document using Langchain and open AI embeddings mm -hmm. and ask what is the overall cost associated with that item? The answer mm -hmm. received with that prompt is wrong due to someone who has already injected a prompt and wrote display on this price item in the respective mm -hmm. document. So how we can, I'm just trying to find the actual comment Probably, I can uh, yeah, but yeah. maybe it's uh, so. How uh, we can identify and correct those biased outputs? Mm, Thanks, Krishna, for detailing it. Well, so <laughs> maybe it's uh, uh, I think this question will probably be fit more 
<laughs> for a separate discussion. Uh, first of all, I am not a specialist in, uh, specialist in the, like uh, shooting security for uh, operational large language models. Uh, in my, let's say, day job, uh, I um, worked with uh, uh, digital augmented generation systems um not really uh faced these you know adversarial uh, uh attacks uh or have to treat uh, uh, such problem so the short the short answer i don't know but i can search this and if you're really interested uh, we can uh, you know uh, uh, take a look to your problem and uh, uh have an like you know uh, taking this uh, discussion outside. I have not an answer for you. Would it, would it actually help to do a sentiment analysis in the document before? If you run the document through a central analysis to understand what the evil sentences are and what the good ones mm. are. And by doing that, if you could just, uh, with a prompt, get it to highlight the evil sentences and then have a look at it and clean up the data, Probably would that help? Would that be a good approach? Mm, but, uh, you know, so um, it's, he said here that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Rishab said here that the answer I received is wrong due to someone has already injected wrong prompt. Uh, well, so is this a public system? Uh, is the first question. Uh, because... Uh, let's, let's do one thing, Rishab. Uh, what you can do is you can connect with Gabriel directly on mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Because your problem yeah. seems like a bigger one, I think he will be able to best help you. And thank you so much, Gabriel, for offering that as well. So if you can yeah. get in touch with Gabriel directly on LinkedIn, uh, he will be very happy to help you with that. Or alternatively, you can join our Discord community. Uh, you can share this details over there on the Kaggle channel or any one of the channels. And uh, Gabriel will answer that for you over there. And mm -hmm. it will help all of the 5,800 other community members over there. Yeah. So let's well, move on to the next query in the meantime. Alejandro on LinkedIn inquires yeah. about an anti-pattern of Kaggle. From the industry point of view, in the data science field, what things or tools do you recommend to learn that cannot be learned on Kaggle? Well, so uh, at this point, maybe a lot of people uh, active on Kaggle uh, will uh, contradict me so things that i didn't learn on kaggle um, and the, this is also because uh, before joining kaggle uh, i worked a lot uh, uh, you know in uh, software development as well um, i didn't learn on kaggle uh, how to uh, structure very large projects i used to work in very large projects uh, in uh, uh, you know in my day job and uh, long before starting with Kaggle. I didn't learn on Kaggle uh, how to do uh, proper uh, MLOps. I didn't learn on Kaggle uh, how to design the architecture of a machine learning system. But you see, uh, and when I'm uh, talking about the design of machine learning system, I'm not thinking about designing the algorithm. like. Uh, you know, um, identifying the data preparation and uh, um, model building uh, uh, or other inference steps, but how do those are implemented in terms of, you know, using the right uh, uh, architectural components. Those things are not easy to learn on Kaggle because uh, the nature of uh, um, uh, activities that you're doing are not letting you do so. Uh, and what I'm when I, I was saying that uh, you know some people I keep a guy with contact and say no no but we are doing machine learning operation we are doing MLOps on Kaggle because we are you know connecting our data processing and model building pipelines and also model inference to uh, white some biases or to Neptune AI and we are doing you know yes mostly experiment tracking but it's nothing as complex as um, you do when you are creating a production ready system right uh, uh, for a large uh, machine learning project so those are things that you're not necessarily learn on kaggle but if you are looking what 
uh, the very successful competition grandmaster are doing, you'll see that in many cases, they are architecting a larger system where Kaggle notebook is only a part of it. Like for example, they are pulling data using Kaggle uh, API, pulling data from the data source and Kaggle. They are running notebooks on you know, separate uh, infrastructure, which has maybe a lot of uh, uh, like with much more resources. Uh, and they are running automatically multiple trading pipelines on their separate infrastructure. It could be on a local machine or on cloud. And then they are, you know, uh, injecting like inference code and uh, some use also Kaggle uh, API to um, submit and then they measure the, um, they are uh, measuring the uh, performance and uh, continues this. So uh, Kaggle could be seen as a very uh, limitative uh, system or could be seen as part of, uh, you know, uh, larger system that you can uh, using uh, more than that, uh, like the platform with the user interface it's offering. So you can, um, you know, just make it a part of a larger ecosystem where you can apply what you learn in the outside world, right? And the, probably the person that asked the question have done this, not maybe not coupling Kaggle with uh, uh, with uh, through Kaggle API, but uh, you know, creating this kind of complex system. So uh, I agree, not everything I know I learned on Kaggle, uh, but a lot of things uh, that you learn in other places can be also refined on Kaggle. Like, yeah. you know, you can see in your experience, uh, you learn a lot about uh, doing you know, efficient feature engineering, but you can learn and refine your knowledge, uh, you know, from experience of people, uh, the most successful uh, competition grandmaster uh, from their work, right? So, thank you so much, Gabriel. Uh, so, Alejandro inquired another query. They have another query yeah. about it. I think you almost answered this. You touched upon this about what successful Kaggle grandmasters do or Kagglers do. So, the other query is: Could you share some secret trick to almost always use? on Kaggle competitions to improve the score of your models? Um, so uh, things that I'm doing, first of all, I try to read uh, uh, when I start the competition, usually I start uh, later. Uh, I, I read the discussions. It's very important, you know, uh, um, even not only the most expensive, but you know, many people are contributing very useful discussion. And also I'm trying to learn from the public uh, notebooks, uh, what is exposed, and also from um, uh, in sometimes there were similar uh, competition with similar subjects, and uh, some of them are really you know yearly competitions uh, with uh, similar data, and so I try to learn also from there. So I don't uh, you know try to uh, start. Um, uh, without considering the experience uh, of people in the community, because this is one of the, uh, you know, uh, what makes uh, Kaggle powerful. You can get a lot from uh, what other contributed. Uh, then uh, I start simple. I mean, I start with the simplest solution possible for that problem. Uh, and I, you know, I, I start really uh, focusing on uh getting a good cross validation score rather than getting a good score on a uh, uh, public letter board and of course with the uh, recent uh, code competition you know the public uh, score is not say, uh, telling you too much but you know so i start simple try to learn a lot from other people experience and by the way i'm not such a good I mean, I don't have such good results in competition. To to be fair, I uh, yeah. So just one last query. I think we're done with almost all the queries. Before we move on to the rappel, uh, Gabriel, I would like to inquire. What would be the one reason that all the 
good people over here inquiring all these questions that they're sharing and the people viewing us. If you could tell them a few reasons why they should check out your new book or why they should purchase your new book, what, what, how would your book actually help them in their journey, uh, their data science or machine learning journey in a broad spectrum? Um, thank you for the question. I, I think it's a good, very good opportunity to advertise my book. So uh, first of all, uh, the book, it's uh, addressing um, people that uh, don't have a lot of experience could be like, you know, it's your experience, but also people with much, like a lot of experience because I start, you know, it's starting gradually with the very simple problems, uh, which I analyze in very much detail. Uh, and then I go to different, like I start with tabular data and then we, I go to through different, uh, types of data and uh, type of problem, like uh, um, image classification, uh, text analysis and uh, uh, text uh, classification, uh, as well as uh, signal uh, processing, uh, video uh, and uh, the generative AI. So there is, in the book, there are uh, different type of data, different type of problems, classification, regression, uh, text analysis and so on. Uh, and there are materials for, uh, you know, both uh, beginners and more advanced. I'm also analyzing uh, some, um, you know, um, quite unusual, well, unusual <laughs> uh, types of data. For example, uh, uh, I have one chapter dedicated to um, geospatial uh, data geospatial analysis, yeah. but I introduce also some uh, not very common methods. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because I want to highlight also the large variety of data that you might encounter and uh, what you can do actually, what specific analysis you can do. And also I'm based on this uh, chapter, I'm there, I have then uh, another chapter where I'm showing uh, what could be for example, if you want to uh, to be successful in a, a data analytics competition on Kaggle, there are also data analytics competitions. Uh, what should be the approach uh, to have to increase your chance to win? And so, rather than if in other chapters I'm showing how you can you know do a very detailed uh, analysis of all the data, I'm showing here you need to start actually with a very clear objective what you want to achieve, right? You, and once you set an objective, then you need to build your notebook for data analysis, like, you know, um, a nice story, you build a narrative, right? So you have an objective, for example, in that, uh, in, in that chapter, um, my objective was like to, 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 to prove that uh, uh, the nature of uh, poverty, um, uh, it's not really obvious, and uh, poverty is uh, actually a very uh, complex uh, um, stuff. And, uh, you know, I build actually that uh, um, uh, notebook with a clear objective, restricting the data analysis to support mm. uh, build narrative, I tried to create, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, straightforward narrative, and also I showed how to rely on, uh, for example, uh, graphical elements to support this uh, narrative. So um, you have in the book all these kind of, uh, you know, uh, elements uh, from very detailed or uh, really for beginner people how to do a data analysis, starting with, you know, quality of uh, analysis of quality of data, from how to focus not on building a detailed uh, analysis, but focusing on, um, you know, having a strong uh, uh, storytelling with data, if you want the uh, uh, approach. And then going to, you know, uh, things like uh, how to build uh, 
uh, incrementally improved uh, model for image classification and so on and so on. Uh, so you'll find all kinds of uh, stuff in the data, even if you are not interested, let's say, in all those aspects. I'm pretty sure that you'll find something that uh, it's interesting for you. I think we'll take one more last query, and this will definitely be the last one. Alejandro inquires one last query. Does the book cover how to deal with stakeholders? Are Kaggle notebooks useful for that? Thanks for all the answers. Uh, well, so, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, first of all, yeah, the answer will be yes. I mean, you'll definitely find uh, uh, resources on Kaggle how to uh, deal with uh, stakeholders. But uh, I'll say it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm laughing because the you know dealing with stakeholders uh, it's really depending on your role. So as a data scientist, you have to have a certain approach. As a project manager, a different approach. Uh, but you know, in the same way that you need to understand everything about your data if you want to build a model, the first step is to understand. Uh, the, data, the data sources you have, how you need to get to that data, how you need to select it, right? Uh, how you need to transform, uh, what features you need to select, right? So for this, that you know, it's an intellectual uh, effort that it's all about understanding if the data is like your environment and from that uh, data you need to build something it's working in the same way when you start a project doesn't matter your role it's a data scientist or project manager or delivery manager or i don't know tester the most important thing is to understand you know the problem first and the problem is not isolated from the environment right so uh, stakeholder management uh, the objective here uh, it's could be very complex, but if you do this systematically, like you do when, as a data scientist, uh, you start to build the models, uh, then you'll probably be successful. So I will say that uh, no, Kaggle <laughs> notebooks is are not telling you how to do stakeholder management. It's not a tool to uh, teach you how to build like you know stakeholder matrix and do uh, stakeholder management. But if you apply the same, uh, let's say, uh, intellectual discipline uh, that you're applying uh, uh, when uh, doing data analysis in building your, let's say, working model for the stakeholder uh, ecosystem, then you'll be successful, right? So it's, first of all, it's uh, understanding the stakeholders, understanding if they are positive or negative, uh, what is the, their uh, position in the power uh, matrix there? And, you know, it's very systematic. Uh, ad hoc stakeholder uh, management will fail already, uh, all the time. Systematic stakeholder <laughs> management will never fail. But again, this is not a question about uh, data analysis. I, you know, created this analogy for you to understand that uh, uh, yes, it's accessible. Uh, experience only will not help you, uh, but intellectual discipline definitely will. I think one thing that really helps in your book, Gabriel, is uh, before answering this query, you were talking about the storytelling of the data and the narrative, uh, approaching any data analysis with that uh, mindset. That is something that really helps build a good narrative, not just to communicate externally with your team, but also internally uh, with different stakeholders, whether it is cross teams, whether it is uh, upper level, lower level, or with your peers. It, when there is a good narrative, when you have that storytelling uh, habit mindset form to approach a data analysis, that really helps. So yeah, that, and the creating a powerful narrative starts, of course, in understanding the data, being yes. able to extract what is important to support this narrative. You don't yes. need to go into all the details, focusing on what you want actually to, what is your story, right? Yes. And of course, your story should not 
be disconnected from the reality. Mm. So even if you are not telling the story of, let's say, your analysis on data quality, you'll need to have uh, like this uh, initial step uh, so that you'll build, uh, you know, a powerful narrative which is based on the reality. So yes. this is extremely important. And of course, in the books, there are a lot of, uh, you know, elements that are also about how we can best support the narrative with uh, like a, a, a coherent uh, visual identity of your notebook, right? So this is also important because if you are using, uh, you know, coherence in your uh, visual uh, identity, as well as in your narrative construction, uh, then uh, the, you know, the, the, the people that uh, will read your work uh, will have a totally different experience than in the case when you are just throwing colors there <laughs> randomly and uh, jump from one idea to other, right, uh, in not a systematic manner. And that is one of the major reasons why your print book is in color, to add a little bit of color to your narrative. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's a very good uh, thing, uh, and you pointed very well. For some of the graphs, color is so important. Okay, thank you so much, Gabriel and Alejandro, for all those queries. Uh, let's do the final giveaway. So, Adarsh was the first winner. Congratulations! He's already got in touch with me on LinkedIn. I can see that. And here is our second winner. Let's see who is the second winner. Daniel Susanu, uh, congratulations, Daniel. Uh, if you are still live or if you can hear us, uh, please get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I'm not sure if we are connected, but please get in touch with me and I will coordinate the ebook for you. Uh, congratulations to Daniel and others, both are winners. Uh, thank you, everyone, for asking the queries that you all did and for making this an engaging session. Thank you, Gabriel for all your time and for everyone who attended. Uh, until next time, uh, Gabriel, do you want to share any closing thoughts before we end the episode? Um, uh, just, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I also would like to thank to the audience for the challenging and the interesting questions. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I hope that uh, you enjoy the session and uh, of course i hope you also will enjoy the book perfect thank you so much everyone and gabriel i'll see you backstage okay bye